neck should be inspected and palpated for the presence of masses, cysts, or sinus tracts. Lateral and vertical range of motion should be assessed. The thyroid gland is located on the midline and is usually not palpable unless it is enlarged. The overall physical structure of the chest is assessed next. Reference lines in describing physical findings on chest and lung exam include the midsternal line, which bisects the suprasternal notch, the nipple line, which is the horizontal line drawn through the nipples, the midclavicular line, which is the vertical line drawn through the right and left clavicle, and the anterior axillary line, which extends vertically from the anterior axillary fold to the diaphragm. To begin the assessment of the lungs, the practitioner evaluates the respiratory rate and the quality of respirations. This infant demonstrates a normal breathing pattern and rate. Newborn respirations are frequently described as diaphragmatic. This is because as the diaphragm contracts and moves down to create a negative intrathoracic pressure, the lower thorax pulls in and the abdomen bulges with each respiration. In addition, neonates have a very compliant chest wall. Although not demonstrated by this infant, you may note mild retractions between the ribs. Auscultation of breath sounds should occur next since further inspection will require manipulation of the neonate which may cause the infant to cry, interfering with auscultation. Assessing the neonate's breath sounds should be done in an organized, sequential manner, beginning at the top of the chest and moving from side to side. Breath sounds should be symmetrical throughout the lungs. Breath sounds in the lower lobes of the lungs can be assessed adequately only through the infant's back, although this is not always possible or desired in sick neonates. Breath sounds in the newborn should be assessed for pitch, intensity, and duration. Normally, breath sounds can be described as vesicular. This describes breath sounds that are soft, short, and low-pitched during expiration, and louder, longer, and higher-pitched during inspiration. These sounds are normally found over the entire chest, except over the manubrium and trachea. Shortly after birth, it is not unusual to hear rowels as the neonate continues to reabsorb fetal lung fluid from the alveoli. After a thorough inspection of the chest and auscultation has been performed, the chest circumference is measured at the largest diameter. Palpation of certain areas of the chest complete the chest exam. These areas include the ribs, sternum, nipples, and breast tissue. The nipples and breast tissue should be inspected and palpated to evaluate for the presence of hypertrophy, fissures, secretions, or masses. Assessment of the neonatal cardiovascular system should begin with observation of the infant's general appearance. This should include inspection of the infant's color, observing for signs of central cyanosis, breathing patterns, activity level, perfusion and mottling, and recognition of extracardiac anomalies that may be associated with congenital heart disease. Once this general inspection is complete, closer inspection of the precordium and apical impulse is necessary. The precordium is the area on the anterior chest wall under which the heart lies. The apical impulse represents the movement of the left ventricle during contraction. It is usually visualized in the neonate in the fourth intercostal space at approximately the midclavicular line. The examiner should note the general activity of the precordium and the position of the apical impulse. A hyperactive precordium in a full-term neonate, especially after the first few hours of life, or shifting of the apical impulse may indicate congenital heart disease. There is no visible precordial activity noted in this infant. Once inspection of the precordium is complete, Light palpation of the precordium can yield further information about the cardiovascular system. The apical impulse may be further defined using the fingertips. In addition, the PMI, or point of maximum impulse, should be palpated. The PMI and apical impulse may be the same, but sometimes during the first few hours of life, the PMI will be localized at the fifth intercostal space along the left sternal border or substernally. 
This finding is normal at this time and represents the right ventricular predominance found in the normal neonate. Palpation is also useful in helping further define the perfusion state of the neonate. This is done by checking capillary refill. A finger is lightly pressed against the neonate skin in a central and peripheral area. Blanching is determined and the number of seconds required for the color to return to the skin is counted. This infant demonstrates a normal capillary refill of less than three to four seconds. Finally, palpation is used to evaluate the peripheral pulses. Using the index finger, the brachial, femoral, radial, posterior tibial, dorsalis pedis, and popliteal pulses can be palpated. At a minimum, the brachial and femoral pulses should be palpated and compared. The rate, rhythm, strength, and character of the pulses should be assessed. The volume of the peripheral pulses is graded on a scale of zero to four plus. Zero represents an absent pulse, and four plus represents the strongest pulse. The absent or bounding pulses should be noted and may indicate specific cardiac lesions. After inspection and palpation, the examiner uses a pediatric stethoscope to auscultate the neonate's heart. The infant should be quiet and the stethoscope warmed. The stethoscope is first placed over the chest and the heart rate is auscultated. The four auscultory areas of the heart are examined next. These areas include the aortic, which is the second intercostal space at the right sternal angle, the pulmonic, which is the second intercostal space at the left sternal angle, the tricuspid, which is the fourth intercostal space at the left sternal angle, and the mitral area, which is the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line. In addition to these areas, valuable information about the cardiac status may be obtained from examining the left and right infraclavicular areas, the left and right axillary areas, the right chest, and both sides of the back. If a murmur is heard, the anterior fontanel and the liver should be auscultated to evaluate for arteriovenous fistulas, which are most commonly found in these two areas. During auscultation of these areas, it is important to evaluate the heart sounds for rhythm and regularity and the presence of murmurs. Any irregular rhythm must be noted and carefully assessed for frequency of occurrence and any recognizable repetition. There are two normal heart sounds referred to as S1 and S2. S1 is heard with the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves, and S2 is heard with closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. S1 occurs at the onset of ventricular contraction and will be heard best at the apex of the heart. S2 is usually heard loudest at the base of the heart. Adventitious or extra heart sounds, such as splitting of S1 or S2, or S3 and S4 gallops and clicks, can also potentially be heard in neonates. The ability to hear these in neonates takes much practice due to the rapid rate of the newborn's heart and will not be discussed further here. Cardiac murmurs are abnormal sounds created by turbulent blood flow. When evaluating a murmur, it is important to determine five characteristics, location, intensity, timing, pitch, and radiation. Most murmurs are usually located below where they are best heard. Therefore, a murmur from a ventricular septal defect would best be heard at the lower left sternal border. The intensity of a murmur is graded on a scale of one to six, with grade one being barely audible and grade six heard with the stethoscope just off the chest. The timing of the murmur refers to where in relation to S1 and S2 the murmur occurs. The pitch refers to the tone of the murmur and radiation identifies all locations where the murmur can be heard. A murmur from a patent ductus arteriosus will radiate from the upper left sternal border to the back of the baby following the branching of the pulmonary vessels. The abdominal assessment should proceed in an orderly fashion beginning with the least intrusive technique. First, inspect the abdomen for movement and shape. Normal movements are synchronous with chest movements. 
intermittent peristaltic movements become visible after the first hour of life. The shape of the abdomen appears slightly distended due to poor muscular tone. The midline of the abdomen is normally closed, but the diastasis recti, a gap between the rectus muscles, is a common finding in otherwise healthy infants. Signs of diastasis recti are a palpable midline gap and a visible bulging at the site in the crying infant. The umbilical cord should be examined for the number of vessels, color, odor, drainage, and thickness. Normally, the umbilical cord is bluish white and gelatinous at birth. There should be two arteries and one vein noted. The arteries are thick-walled with a very tiny lumen. The vein is thin-walled with a gaping lumen. The cord darkens and shrivels as it dries, falling off within 10 to 14 days. The examiner should listen to all four quadrants of the abdomen. Bowel sounds become audible within the first 15 minutes after birth. The sounds have a metallic tinkling or rumbling quality. Gently palpate the abdomen with warm hands. Observe for pain response. Generalized palpation of the abdomen covering all four quadrants should be done to detect possible identification of masses. With pads of the fingertips and the fingers together, begin with a shallow, smooth, gentle pressure, then proceed with deeper palpation. To facilitate palpation of specific organs, flex the infant's knees and hips with one hand and use the free hand to palpate the abdomen. This maneuver relaxes the abdominal musculature. To palpate the liver, place the index finger just above the groin parallel to the right costal margin and with a gentle compressing motion, gradually move the finger upward until the liver edge is felt. Normally, the liver edge is felt one to two centimeters below the right costal margin at the mid-clavicular line. This liver is palpated one centimeter below the right costal margin. The normal liver is smooth and firm with a sharp and well-defined edge. A similar approach is used on the left side of the abdomen to palpate the spleen. Normally, the spleen is not felt. Kidneys are sometimes difficult to palpate. The ideal time to palpate normal kidneys is immediately after birth. Place one hand under the infant's flank and press downward with the other hand. Because the liver may interfere with palpation of the right kidney, the left kidney is more easily palpated. Large amounts of stool in the colon will also interfere with palpation. Examination of genitalia in the term female infant should reveal the labia majora to be large and may completely cover the clitoris and labia minora. The urethral meatus is often difficult to visualize. It is located directly below the clitoris. The vaginal opening should be examined next. There should be a fingertip space between the vagina and the anus in the term infant. A whitish serosanguinous or bloody vaginal discharge may be present during the first few days after birth. This normal discharge results from withdrawal of maternal estrogen absorbed by the fetus. Another normal finding is a hymenal tag. The tag disappears in several weeks. Examination of the male genitalia begins with assessing the length and size of the penis. The prepuce or foreskin normally covers the entire glands and is quite tight. However, this infant was recently circumcised, so we will demonstrate retraction of the foreskin during the preterm infant examination. The urethral opening or meatus should be located at the tip of the glands of the penis. The scrotum should be inspected for rugation, color, and size. This term male infant has rugae throughout the scrotum. The scrotal sac should be palpated for testes. The testes in a term male should be palpated low in the scrotum as they are in this neonate. The perianal area and anus are inspected. It is also important to note whether the infant has stool to further evaluate rectal patency.